Welcome back to Action Figures Planet Earth. My name's Richard. Today we are here with the one and only Miss Elaine Goodlad. Elaine, hi. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for Hanging having me. Hanging out at the compound here, right? No problem. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when I started thinking about people for this uh, particular group of, of, um, uh, of shots that we wanted to do, um, you know, you and I know a lot of the same people. And uh, by the way, you're the first female guest on the show, really? in the show's history. So what? number one, groundbreaker. Yeah, so thank oh you for that. Gosh. But also, um, I, I, I was always fascinated by your story because, you know, you've been to the top of the mountain in the fitness pro world, and then you had to reinvent yourself, and you're now a business owner, and you're doing ev everything on your own. So I, I said, I got to have a conversation oh, with Halloween. So it's going to be a good one. Yeah, well, thanks for joining <laughs> us. So let, let's kind of start at the beginning a little bit. And for those who don't know your full story, you grew up in Canada, right? Yes, I grew up in a really small town, 1,500 people in Canada, farming community. So I was raised just basically in the environment where you're, you're raised to be a worker. Mm. You know, if, if your dad needs drivers, then you're driving tractors, trucks. As soon as you can reach the clutch, you're a driver. <laughs> so I've been driving tractors, three-ton trucks since I was 12. No kidding. So in the farming community, sure. you're, you're a driver. So picking rocks, driving trucks, working on the farm. Yeah. yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. You miss Canada? You know what I miss? It's a beautiful place. <coughs> I love being from there. I would never move back. There's yeah. lots of reasons why, but sure. no, it's it's a beautiful place. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Well, we kind of get spoiled in Vegas too. I mean. Yeah, I mean we have access to everything yeah, here yeah. and then all the sunshine. So from there being 40 below, sometimes it's 60 below with the mm. windshield factor. So 60 below or it's 100 and. 50 degrees here, yeah. hot, so you either stay inside because it's too cold or you stay yeah. inside because it's too hot. You know, I never thought about that, but I was, it, it, not to divert too far, but I was, on, I was in the Dominican Republic um, two years ago during the winter, and there was a, a couple uh, from Canada there on a boat that we were all on, and uh, he said, yeah, when I left, it was like 30 below. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why do you guys live there? He said, I'm starting to question that myself now. Oh, and he still time, lived there. Yeah, he oh probably gosh. still does Some live there. Some of us know when to leave. <laughs> yeah, you just yeah. know when, when you've had enough. Wow, that's amazing. You know, when you're raised in it, you're used to it. Sure. We would put on our complete snow suits, our Sorrel boots, wrap a scarf around our head, just our yeah, eyes exposed, yeah. and we would walk to school in 30 wow. below. That's just the environment you're, you're raised in. You yeah. don't know any different. Yeah, yeah. Until yeah. you come... Until you like come this, here, yeah. it's like, what was I doing there for 40 years? <laughs> well, you think about, like, this week it's been close to 110, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. You think about the, the delta between 110 and minus, minus 30 or 40. whatever. Yeah, you're like, oh, that's a big gosh. stretch. It's crazy, crazy. pretty durable. Um, I, I think uh, you turned... So let, let's talk about first how you got into uh, the, the fitness competition world because I think that's... Um, mm. a, a lot of people... Uh, certainly everybody knows about bodybuilders and all that, but they don't understand the relationship between the fitness world and the bodybuilding world. But then also, I would argue that uh, a, a fitness competitor goes through some of the same maniacal diet swings because uh, the, it, it's such a subjective sport and so speculative on what maybe a judge might be looking for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I probably have a story that nobody else has and even the reason why why I'm in the competitive <coughs> end of these, this sport. So having come from a small town in whatever environment I was raised mm -hmm. in, I developed some unhealthy eating habits. Okay. And so I was, I think I had a, a food addiction <coughs> since I was a very little girl. So food became my outlet. Mm. So some people, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Mine was food from very, very early on. So I just remember being obsessed with food my whole life. Wow. So as I grew up, um, that food addiction, you know, turned into a bit of an eating disorder at some point um, when you're feeling, and it's really never about food. Right. Okay. It's, a, it's used as a coping huh. mechanism. Same with alcohol, sense. drugs, everything. Those aren't the key. The key is, is what led you to require that coping mechanism. Mm. A lot of people don't think about that, but my food addiction was my savior. That was, you know, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. My dad was also a Baptist minister. Mm. So we were farmers, Baptist minister family, sure. um, very, very religious upbringing. So um, there weren't a lot of outlets, especially because they were very strict in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I, um, I convinced them to send me off to a 
private school at a very young age just so I could get away from home yeah. and still be in a place where they would accept, you know? Sure. So, and from there just was basically living my own life at a very, very early age. So I kind of got into training at the gym to offset my eating habits. Mm. So I loved food too much and I knew this was going to be a disaster. Yeah. I had some very, my dad is one of 12 kids. My, all my aunts were over 200 pounds. Wow. I was like, yeah, I don't really want to turn out like that. So I started working out at the gym just to offset my, my eating because mm -hmm. it was out of control. Mm. So I got into the gym and, and didn't realize how much confidence in time, just training at the gym and being able to develop my body in a way I never even knew possible that was really a, a great outlet for me. Sure. So I started the bodybuilding thing when there was only bodybuilding. As you know, sure. fitness came later and yep. then everything came later. Bodybuilding right. was first. So when I started into it, there was only bodybuilding. So we were, everything was called bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't call it that, I don't call it that anymore yeah. for myself. But so I started training when I was about 22 and just started evolving, mm -hmm. okay? But as of 24 on, I was a hairstylist. I was in the cosmetology industry, so I had my own hair salon by the time I was 24. No kidding, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, and so I was, I've been an entrepreneur since 24. Yeah. So I actually, that's the, I, that's the only life I can live. <laughs> right, yeah. You know yourself, yeah. you can't go work for somebody you else yeah. ever. It, it, you're, you're ruined in a way for, yes. yeah. yeah for you're that. either too afraid to be an entrepreneur or you're too afraid now not to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. I'm just not gonna go back and be, have you know, somebody else controlling what I do and how sure. I do it. Yeah. So I've been a makeup and hair person my whole life. I mean, I started cutting hair when I was 18. For some reason, I could just cut hair. Yeah. I hadn't even been to school yet. So when I went to cosmetology and they were looking at my work, they're like, where, where did you learn how to do this? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, it just, it just came to me. So cosmetology was very natural for me. So hair and makeup has always been my business, but the training has always been my lifestyle. Wow. So when I met my second husband, we got married at 26. He was a power lifter. And uh, so I was training like a power lifter. I, mean, yeah. I, was, I was lifting <coughs> some ungodly weights. Really? Oh yeah, and, and again, that builds confidence. So yeah. I was raised in an environment to have no confidence at all. My mom was raised to don't ever praise or encourage your children because their heads might swell. Oh, wow. So she, she would, you know, she didn't, she would, she would want to do things differently now, yeah. but she really squashed our confidence. So I grew up with zero self-confidence. So the gym did give me some confidence as well, yeah. um, just to know, yeah, I can, I can achieve something. You know, yeah. I'm not being held down anymore or, or you know, thumb, you sure. know, it, it's just a bad way to, to grow up if you, if you need some self-esteem, you're not gonna get it right. that way. So the gym was very healthy for me, but I was always lifting heavy, heavy, heavy. So that evolved over the years with my, my, now, uh, my second husband. He was training me, coaching me, and I'm looking through the magazines at the time. It's, well, I'm gonna age myself out here, but it was uh, Corey Everson's on the cover oh, yeah. of Oxygen Magazine, yeah. right? I'm like, hey, you know what? I would really like to look like that. Yeah. Like that looks, that's incredible, yeah. you know, I'd love to be on the cover of a magazine one day or whatever. Yeah. And he said to me, he goes, well, he goes, you can do that and I can get you there. I'm like, how do you know that I could do that? Because he saw, I didn't know what the potential in a physique For looked sure. like. Yeah. I didn't know that somebody could say, oh yeah, you have the genetics. I didn't even know what right. that meant. Yeah, yeah. So he said, yeah, no, I can get you there. So he started training and coaching me and just making me better and better and better. Mm -hmm. I still had no intentions of ever competing in a competition, ever, because I had fear beyond belief. Like, if I thought about walking up on a stage, I would be physically ill thinking about it. Yeah. So I <clears throat> had no intentions of it. How this came about, here's the story. Um, I was shooting a little bit for Flex, or sorry, for Oxygen Magazine as a power lifter. They were doing, they were doing a, a layout on a powerlifting girl, but she didn't have that photo look. I understand. She was a really harsh looking, kind of masculine looking woman. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to use somebody who had some experience in powerlifting, yeah. so they used me. Well, Oxygen was, a, their demographic, of their readers were primarily women too, right? Yes, that, yeah, all yeah, women. So I, okay, that makes so sense. So they needed, they wanted a more feminine looking sure. woman to do the article. Yeah. So they chose me and I did this whole powerlifting layout for Oxygen Magazine. That's kind of in the beginning of the, my modeling career. But 
along the way, Flex Magazine wanted to shoot me for, with a Canadian flag bikini up on a mountaintop, a <laughs> snowy mountaintop, because I was from Canada. Right. So my husband says, um, okay, I don't care what you got to do to get yourself prepared in your mind to get on stage, go seek therapy, whatever. Right. He says, but you are going to do one show so that Flex Magazine can cover you for this layout. This mm. is going to be a good opportunity. Yeah. I was dying inside because I never, ever wanted to walk on a stage, ever. I just didn't want to be in front of people. Right. And so he convinced me that I had to get ready for this show. So I get ready for this show. He goes, there's a small show close to home. It's in Seattle. We were living in British Columbia at the yeah. time. And he didn't tell me what the name of it was, nothing. I didn't know anything about mm. these competitions. Yeah. You probably didn't care either. I didn't really. care. Yeah. <laughs> So they had brought about figure now. So fitness was the only thing that came out after bodybuilding. And then they came up with figure, but not in Canada. So figure just started on the scene. He goes, you're going to do a figure competition. We're going to get through this. So I got ready and I was just sick about having to do this <laughs> show. I get on stage. I was the one of 47 girls or something. I won the overall. And I, I'm literally posing on stage, kind of looking out of the corner of my eye, like, what just happened? Did, like, did I, what, what did I just get? Like, I actually won the show, and I didn't even yeah, realize I won right. the show. So I win this show because I had been training for 17 years. Yeah. I had the body. Uh -huh. I just didn't have the competitive experience. Uh -huh. And it obviously went well on my first time. So the Canadian Federation wrote a letter to the IFBB and said, we have an athlete that we can't do anything with because we're not going to have figure for another two years in Canada. Can you look at her at competing on the international level? Yeah. And now, I'm, I'm still not trying to compete, but my husband at sure. the time is like, no, no, this is a really good opportunity. So he arranges all this. The IFBB looks at me at the time, it was Wayne D'Amelia. Remember Wayne D'Amelia? Yep. Mm -hmm. He looks at my profile, looks at me, says, yep, hands me a pro card. On the spot? Like just On the spot. <laughs> I've done one show in my life. Yeah. It's an amateur show. It's sure. not even a qualifier. Right. And they hand me a pro card. So I'm one of the first pro figure girls in that, in that first lineup in history. Unbelievable. So my second show in my life is in the, the inaugural pro figure show at the Arnold Classic. Big deal. Big deal. Now, I'm still as terrified, <laughs> but he says, listen, this is our opportunity to get into the country yeah. because you can get in on a clause called exceptional abilities yep. clause. So mm -hmm. I was an excep exceptional uh, athlete and model, and I had to prove that. Yeah. So I was shooting now all the time for the magazines because now I am a competitor. Right. So now I'm on oxygen covers, and I'm in, in all kinds of layouts, and Flex magazine shoots me all the time, and I've got all the lingerie issues, all the swimsuit issues. So now I've got um, a pile of magazines to hand an immigration lawyer sure. and start that journey. So... Uh, I, I, so I didn't know, I, I knew that you'd won that contest, but I did not know kind of that backstory. That, that's amazing. Yeah. So how long was it when you saw the Corey Everson cover or whatever till that? I mean, was that a relatively short time? You said, I want to be like this. And then the next thing you're, you're in the same Let's world. Let's see. It was, probably, it was probably about three years from when he said, I can get you there to evolving to, hey, Flex Magazine wants to shoot you. Oh, hey, we're going to do this show. Oh, hey, you just got your pro car. I'm like, what is happening yeah. right now? And it was more his dream, my husband at the time, sure. it was his dream because he always, I mean, he competed, but he always, he would have loved to be a professional yeah, athlete. Right. I was not seeking it. Yeah. It just happened to me, but mm -hmm. he was such a good coach and a good motivator, and he still is. He's yeah. an amazing guy. We're not married anymore, sure. but he's an amazing guy. He's still, you know, one of my biggest fans, and he got me there. Unreal. Did you feel like when you won that, that, that contest in Seattle, did you feel like, uh, this is it, I made it. I, I know you were shocked, I you know, did. And, which is a reasonable emotion to experience in that moment, but also you felt like I, I went from, I'm a rock How star How did this happen? Yeah. Exactly, because I was so scared to even stand on stage. I was hoping the stage would just swallow me up. Yeah. Like just get, get me in a crack and I'll die in there. I didn't care. I wanted <laughs> off that stage. It was so terrifying yeah. to me. Um, you know, your legs are shaking, your lips are shaking. You, you don't even know what's happening to you, but it was terrifying. And then I got off stage and he goes, see, now how do you think about right. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. So, I mean, you get off the stage, 
the terrifying part is over. Yeah. But then all of a sudden I'm a pro and I'm going to the Arnold Classic and I have, I'm terrified all over again yeah. because the girls that I was watching in the magazine, like Monica Brandt, I'm going to be on stage with Monica Brandt at my second show in my life. Unreal. And I didn't really know who I was yet. Sure. I wasn't owning it. I was just a little girl from Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You kind of thrust into this limelight that exactly. you didn't even know was. Exactly. Had no intention. The um, uh, posing is such an important part of every aspect of mm -hmm. whether it's bodybuilding, figure. Mm -hmm. How, even, I mean, you won. Did you work on any of the posing before yes. that? Yes. Oh, you did? Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah, so, again, my ex husband, who was my trainer, coach, nutritionist, poser, everything. Yeah. He had the ability to pose, uh -huh. and he was very graceful and very, very, very good at it. So he had me posing every day in front of a video camera, and oh. he showed me the moves and how I was going to move my hands. I said, that's really too much. I go, you're doing too much. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is yeah. like, it was so extravagant, you right. know, and, and you have these wide, you know, mm -hmm. hand movements, and I thought it was going to look really stupid. Yeah. So as I'm watching in the video camera after every posing session, I'm like, Oh, I see that doesn't really look that stupid. Yeah, it translates it, it feels well. feels stupid, yeah, yeah. but it translates into something very graceful. Sure. So he made me practice every day so that when I was nervous, I would go back to what I practiced. And that's what I tell girls all ah. the time when they're so nervous. I go, listen, you're going to go back to what you practiced, and your day today is all about shining. You're not, you have no fear. Your body's there. Your hair and makeup's there because yeah. I'm doing that for you. Mm -hmm. You just need to go out there and pretend you've been out on stage a hundred times. You have to fake it till you make it and don't allow fear because fear is not a good look. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Don't allow that fear to take over on stage. I, I think that's fantastic advice. You know, in a former life, I was a musician and, and mm -hmm. we used to have this phrase, I don't know who in my clique of... Uh, band members kind of came in you know, came up with this but it's always kind of stuck in my mind what you do in practice you will do on stage yes. or in front of people so if you develop a bad habit in practice it's going to eventually make its way out on stage exactly. and, so, and now in a, in a world of cell phones every week, there, sometimes you just don't want those bad habits being displayed you know whether or not you're you know you're you, you're doing something that's a little more improvisational or you know, you don't want that out there. You want to kind of stick to making the overall presentation as great as possible. And that's why the practice, <clears throat> excuse me, the practice is so important because some girls I see practicing, they, they don't even turn their smile up yet. I'm like, no, no, no. You have to smile right now like you're on stage because when sense. you're nervous, you're going to go back to what you practice. Yeah. So you are shining through every practice. Your audience is out there. You got to, it's the real deal. You yeah. got to make it happen. It really yeah. does make all the sense in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think from there, um, maybe it was like a year or so later, but you went to the IFBB California Pro and you won that one, is that I right? I won the Cal yeah, Pro, you won that. yeah. That's right. Again, yeah. I was shocked. You know, all of the things, these things were shocking to yeah. me because I didn't seek it. I wasn't one of those girls that said, I have to get a pro card. And I mean, <clears throat> they're sitting in my chair every day when I'm doing their hair and makeup. They're just all working towards their pro card. Yeah. Well, I happen to be at the right place in the right time in history for this sport because there was only 13 of us invited to the first Arnold Classic. So there was 13 figure pros, period, wow. at the Arnold Classic, and I was one of them, and actually was in the money in my very first show, awesome. in my very first pro show. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's just, it's just a really different thing for me sure. than it was for most. Yeah. But getting up there and getting in the money and having a sponsor from Canada who sponsored me to be here, so I was making a salary just eating, sleeping, training, and competing. The dream. The dream. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have that anymore. They've taken a lot of that away because sure. if you want to stand at a booth and represent somebody, you just got to look good. Yeah. So they're a dime a dozen now, so right. they've taken the salaries away from a lot of the girls, whereas I, I consider myself very blessed sure. and fortunate to have been paid to do that. When you got that first check, were they still giving the big checks on stage back then? Yeah, they give the big checks. Yeah. Uh, you I don't mean, have to tell me the amount, but it's not. It's not no. a lot. Well, it, you, but still, you're like I, I, male bodybuilding makes a lot more money than say figure or any other aspect mm. of the sport. That you know, it, yeah. it's the bodybuilding is a freak show. Everybody yeah. wants to see a freak Everybody show. Everybody wants to see the freak. And show. at that time, I mean, figure was like we're the, we're the pretty girls on stage yeah. now, and so it was. Um, it was it was amazing though. Yeah. I was I couldn't believe it that I was winning a pro show. Sure. Yeah, couldn't did, believe it. Did you feel this immense pressure to maintain that momentum? Because get you know, it's just like anything else. Getting to the top may or may not be easy depending on what it is, 
but staying on top staying is, on is top. even harder. Exactly. My first two seasons, I did 12 pro shows. So wow. in my first two seasons, I did, I did all of the pro shows that I could, that, that they had. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I did, that's a lot. Okay. In yeah. two seasons, 12 yeah. pro shows, yeah. that's a lot. So I went, I never was not dieting yeah. and not every two for months. A show, you you right? gotta be on. Exactly. But for me, I'm now in the country to get a green card. Mm. So I have to remain top 10 in the world in my sport, whether I'm a race car driver, a <laughs> hockey player, or a fitness competitor, yeah. I have to be top 10. So for me, it was a different kind of pressure. I didn't do it because I loved it. I did it because I had an, a means to an end. And so I was competing, had to stay on top. So my first two seasons, I think I was top five my first two seasons. Mm -hmm. And then as you know, more girls come yeah, along yeah, yeah. and, and Realized I started competing when I was 39. So I was old school yeah. and in a new sport. Yeah. And there was no master. So I'm with I'm with these 20 something year old girls. Some of them are five feet tall, some of them are I'm I'm five seven and uh -huh. I'm I was 39 at the time, competing till I was 44, 45. Uh -huh. And so these younger girls are coming along and you know their skin's all youthful yeah. and nice so now bodies I'm going, just look different when they're younger yeah. they, they do yeah. and I, I'm not I'm not in denial like oh uh, you know why are they winning and no I was top five and then I was I got bumped down to about I was always in eighth place after that yeah. so my three fourth and fifth season I remained in about eighth place yeah. so they kept me there but I wasn't in the top five anymore sure. and I my body was looking better and better and better as the years went on, you know how your competitive yeah. body evolves, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, be, I wasn't placing as well. Gotcha. And I know, I know what it's like. Like you said, it's a subjective sport. Yeah. So if you, have, if you have a lineup of cars, okay, do you like the Bugatti? Do you like the Lamborghini? Do you like, what sure. car do you like? Yeah, yeah, Every judge might pick a different car, Agreed. you know? So it's the same with our bodies. And I had, I had a lot of fans oh my gosh, you should have won the Olympia. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I shouldn't have, but thank you. <laughs> because that's what they like. Right. But then the winner, she's got a bunch of fans and she's got, you know, yeah. it's just, it, I never took it personal. I just sure. used it as an opportunity to inspire women all around the world. Yeah, that's, well, I that's think what, you did. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that I never really considered about your story was the green card element though. So you had to stay, remain a top 10 level competitor uh, so you could prove to the U.S. government that you deserve to be here right. and, and you're an exceptional talent. The, uh, I, 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 I don't know, I'm kind of blown away by that because so many of these other girls that you were competing against, um, they're, they're there for the money, the notoriety, the sponsorships, you know, whatever, yeah. which is all fine. Mm -hmm. um, but you had to throw that extra part of the recipe in in order, you were fighting to stay in a country so you didn't have to go back to Canada. I mean, that's, that's amazing to me. The, the one thing that made it a little easier was the fact that I had the experience in the modeling world. So now I, was, I could hand my magazines to my immigration lawyer and he go, oh, well obviously you're chosen yeah. to do this over and above whatever American citizens could have been chosen. Mm -hmm. So I had to have my oxygen magazine training layouts sexy layouts, swimsuit layouts, articles that I had written, covers in foreign countries, covers in the United States. Yeah. I had, had like six categories of magazine work. So that helped a lot yeah. because it was a given that I was, that I was chosen for something, right? Sure. And then um, I had to get letters from all the magazine editors, letters from the IFBB saying, oh yes, we need Elaine, she's exceptional right. because. So coming from a small town, I'm a small, town girl that doesn't have a lot of self-esteem, having people write letters telling how exceptional I am, that was hard for me. I'm like, I, I just felt it was really uncomfortable, yeah. but it was part of the program. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's we something did it. that needed to be done. In 2009, I believe my green card came in the mail. Really? Yeah. Wow. They didn't even tell you, it just shows up? Just You're like, shows here you up. go. 2008, maybe. It just shows up finally, and I'm reading my letter, and I'm crying, permanent resident of the United States nice. of America. And I was prepping for the SAC Pro at yeah. that time. I got my letter, cry, read it, make sure it says what I think it <laughs> yeah. says. And then I literally went straight to my favorite restaurant, which at the time was Claim Jumper. Oh yeah, yeah. 
and I annihilated myself. <laughs> I was like, I even am in pre-contest, I prep. finished. I didn't. I didn't do the show. <laughs> I was so done. I was I like, there is no more show. Yeah, yeah. What? But you hit I your did goal. Nineteen pro shows back to back. Half the time I didn't remember my middle name. Wow. I'd be driving along the street, stop at a four-way stop, four stop signs. I would just sit there until someone honked at me because I'm sitting at a light as far as I'm yeah, concerned. Right. It was just, what? what's my name? That is amazing. <laughs> you know, you're dieting you for five years sacrum. straight, yeah. no breaks. It was just crazy. Yeah, yeah, that stuff will make you crazy. Oh, um, yeah. I can't believe that you just said forget I got. But you got what you wanted. So, I got what I wanted. I mean, that's yeah. what goal setting is about. Yeah. That's, you know. Oh man, that's amazing. I love that. And because my, my um, reason for being there changed along the way, when I realized that, and, and here's, here's how this came more about for me, where my reason changed for being there, is I think I was about to walk on stage at the Arnold or the Olympia one year. I think it was probably my first year because that was the year I was so terrified. Mm -hmm. It was the Olympia. I was terrified. And my coach... I'll stop saying ex-husband. I'll call him sure, my coach. coach. <laughs> my coach says to me, Elaine, stop making this about you. Mm. This isn't about you. He said, do you know how many women are sitting out in that audience right That's now deep. that don't have the guts or the, or the support or genetic anything gift? to be there? The yeah. genetic yeah. gift. Or they're sitting in that audience. They might be beaten down by life, by a husband, by work, whatever. You're doing this for them. He said, you're going to look at those judges for a brief second, scan them. He goes, and then you're going to look beyond their heads and you're going to look out to that sea of women and they can look at you and say, if she can oh, do man, it, maybe good. I can do it. It gives me chills. And it gave me, I, I have chills right now. <laughs> yeah, Every time I give that speech, it gives me chills. And that speech changed my life. Yeah. He said, he said whether you have an ego or whether you're scared to death, he goes, it all still makes it about you. If you're scared to death, you're afraid to share your gift. So hmm. stop making it about you. Walk out there and represent your sport and inspire those women. That's and incredible. I was literally crying. Yeah, yeah. And then I went out there and I did my slowest, most confident walk I had ever done in my life. And I realized I'm there for them. This is not about me. That's if awesome. you can't be in a sport or in a job or in a, in a place in life where you're gonna affect other people, what are you doing? Yeah. That's, that's my thing. Pro figure, bodybuilder, it doesn't matter. That's a very selfish sport for him to give that to you right at the exact moment you needed in such a selfish environment. I mean, exactly. it, it's a selfish sport because you're always in the mirror. All day long, yeah. you're looking at your abs. Oh yeah. my gosh, are my abs still there? Yeah. Oh, how's my butt look? It's, it's nauseating. It really is. <laughs> That's a great word for it. And so for him to put that on me and say, it, it made me not even want to look in the mirror anymore. I'm yeah. like, no, I need to just represent in the best way I can because I'm here now, Sure. but it's not going to be about me anymore. That is super deep. That, yeah, uh, it was. It hit me hard. Yeah. You know, a lot of these interviews that I get to do with people who are highly accomplished individuals, I, I always get, I feel like I get a little game from somebody. They're always something. putting me up on something. I'm gonna, that, that's out of this interview so far anyway. That's, that's, that's the and one thing. And it's the interview, me. I mean, it's the, it's the speech that gave me the <laughs> most to give back to others because now keep in mind, I got into the, uh, before I competed, I was doing hair and makeup for the fitness pros mm -hmm. at their shows. Yeah. So Jenny Hendershot, Kelly Ryan, who's now yeah. out of jail. Yeah. Um, all those top girls, I was their makeup artist. So when I started competing, I was doing less makeup, especially if I'm competing in a show, I'm not doing anybody else's, but if I'm not competing, I'll do your makeup. But after that, I continued, when I retired, I continued doing hair and makeup. So I'm somewhere every single weekend mm -hmm. in the country doing hair and makeup, yeah. a lot of hair and makeup for these shows. So these girls sit in my chair. What are they? They're afraid. They're, they don't have the confidence, but they should have the confidence. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all about them, but they're still nervous. Like, it's just, it's just one of those sports that's so self-absorbed sure. for some of the right reasons, some of the wrong yeah. reasons. So every time I have a woman in my chair for 30 minutes, that's, and I give them that speech, they're literally blown away. Like, thank you for that. And yeah. they go out there, they come to me afterwards and say, that speech got me on stage. That's kick -ass. I was out there inspiring women and you changed my life. That's amazing. And that means more to me than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it should. I think you're on the right track. Uh, what, what is the average age, would you say, of the girls that, that you find in your chair? 
you know, they, they're as, as, uh, as young as 18. Wow. Or 17, and, and as old as 65. No, because you know the oh, masters well, they, yeah, a master's, classes yeah. are so, and apparently my age inspired the masters classes to begin with. So there, because I was forty-four uh -huh. and I'm a pro, a lot of these women got into it thinking because they started masters in the. I, I, I'm told that I'm one of the reasons that the masters yeah. thing even came along because I was the oldest one doing it at the time, and then they started these masters classes. But I have I have women in the chair that say, you know what, I'm just going to do a show, and they're Incredible. sixty years old. Incredible. I'm like, wow, good for you. <laughs> I didn't know that you were one of the inspirations for that. Did you ever go through a period in your life, I've never heard you talk about it anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, where um, you, you went through your rock star ego phase? Did you, did you deal with that? I'm a lane good. No, no one can tell me anything. No, nothing. that was beat out of me in childhood. <laughs> okay, so fair enough. So <laughs> where I came from, and that's another thing, where I came from, I was never going to have that. Never. Yeah. So I never had that. As a matter of fact, um, I suffered because of that environment. I suffered from depression, anxiety, and fear my whole life. Yeah. And so even when I went through that whole phase of competing, I'm in the magazines, I'm on, I was on four oxygen covers, yeah. I was on Muscle and Fitness Hers cover. I, all of that, I would leave that environment and go, how did I even get there? I was always surprised. And so I never had that I never had that ego, and so when I get to the shows and there's a lineup of people there for my autograph, yeah. I kid you not, and you know how men are when you walk up to, oh, that's so and so, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And they got the camera around their neck. There wasn't, they weren't doing the cell phones right. yet. It was camera around your neck, and they're like, um, um, could I get my picture taken with you? And they're scared to death. I'm like, I'm like, sure, come on up. Yeah. Like, what do you? I, I'm just Elaine, yeah. and that's how I always approached them. So they would come over, we'd take pictures, and they would come back to me after like a three-day expo and say, well, I just had to come back and tell you that you were the most approachable person in this entire building. And they told me some of the experiences they had with other sure. pros, and they were really, really turned off. Wow. And so they come back and tell me that this was a very pleasant experience because, listen, this is a small niche market in the world, yeah, okay? Yeah. If you have an ego because you're at the top of the fitness world, what is wrong with you, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You're just the person. It sounds so sensible when you say it like it that. It does. I'm just Elaine. I'm Elaine from Wadena, Saskatchewan, <laughs> yeah. tiny little town. I drove a tractor before I could ride a bike. Right. Like, I'm, I'm that girl. Right. And so I take that into the rest of my life, whatever I do. It's amazing. I've got a clothing company now called Blessed Body Wear. It's actually, I'm wearing it, Blessed. Nice. Um, it's, a, it's a Brazilian fitness line. My, my designer is a, a beautiful, wonderful Brazilian girl. And we use the line to inspire women. Mm -hmm. It just, everything we do, we realize we're here. Hey, God put me there for a reason. Yeah. There's no way I got from small town Saskatchewan to the Olympia stage unless it was God. Yeah. because. Yeah. I have one show under my belt before I become a pro, yeah. and I'm handed a pro card before I ever stepped. My like, it just God. doesn't make sense. I understand, yeah. So if I'm not here to do good, then I better go home. I, I, I love that. You know, I was thinking about why you were making that statement to the, uh, you know, going back to the magazine component, how the, uh, having all of this, these volumes of magazines to prove who you are to the immigration folks in America, um, but how that also was used to inspire some of the older ladies uh, yeah, to, 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 to compete to do or, that as well. or do whatever, even just to train to get That's into amazing. shape. Because, he, and this is what Robert Kennedy, um, he was the, you know, Robert Kennedy yes, uh -huh. owned all the, Mr. the publishing, Kennedy Publishing. He always told me, he said, Elaine, he goes, you can have a 25 year old on a cover of a magazine. A woman walks up in the grocery store, says, well, I want to look like that, but she's 25. So my last oxygen cover, I was 48. And he said to me, you are gonna inspire 20 year olds and you're gonna inspire 60 year olds because <laughs> they can't look at that and go, oh, easy for her to say she's right. 48, what? Yeah. Oh, okay, so there's hope for me yeah. because I was willing to put my age on, on that cover. Yeah. You can keep your age to yourself and you can do better in the shows if nobody knows how old you are. Ah. But if they know how old you are, which is what we decided to do every time I was on a cover, we would announce, this is my age. Sure. You can do this. You know, I'm, you're not too young. You're yeah. not too old. And um, 
so that's what we decided to do, but I was 48 on my last cover, and Robert Kennedy inspired me to do that. Mm -hmm. No kidding. Yeah. Do you think that, um, I mean, and I, I know why you did that, because you wanted to be an inspiration, and you want to let other women know that they could achieve something similar. Maybe they didn't want to be famous, in that, but they wanted to have a great body and, and remain in shape and be healthy, but do you think that you hurt, um, hurt yourself at the mm -hmm. contest by doing that? Yeah, I did, and it was a conversation we had what's most important to us here. Because when I was 39 competing, everybody thought I was 29. Mm -hmm. I'd even convinced myself I was 29. <laughs> you tell yourself you're 29 long enough, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, yeah, I'm gonna be 39, what? <laughs> what happened? So it was a conversation that we said, do we want to inspire women, or do we want to do well in the competitions? Is that really important to mm -hmm. us? And we, it didn't take long for us to decide that that was not our motivation. Our motivation was to, to help somebody. And so, in doing so, you're in the magazine, you're 48. Oh, look, she's writing about her eating disorder. Who does that in a magazine? Mm. I'm, I don't care that I had an eating disorder, yeah. I care that I overcame it. Yeah. And so if I can help other women overcome it, then I can put that in a magazine, yeah. I can reach a lot more people. So we use the magazines as a forum to reach people on important topics. Yeah. Yeah. Because I came from a place of zero self-confidence to standing on the Olympia stage twice and I just honestly still feel that blessed to be yeah. there, and I still don't know how I got there. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> is the whole way your house lined with all your magazine covers, or do you no, even pay attention to it No, you know what? Anymore? I don't. They're all in storage. <laughs> this is a funny story. I had some. I had a couple guy friends come help me move the last time we were putting. I was putting a lot of stuff in storage, and there were boxes and boxes that were so heavy the guys could hardly lift them, yeah. and it said magazines on it. And I, he goes, "What are these?" And I said, "Those are my magazines, you know, that I was in." Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, couldn't you just keep one copy? Did you have, I go, no, they're all different magazines that I was in. Oh, wow. He, had, he was a friend of mine and had no clue what I did. That's amazing. He had amazing. no clue that I had like 200 magazines, so I had boxes. Yeah. Because at the, we weren't doing digital at the time. Sure. It was <laughs> like, you know. I remember, yeah. Yeah. So I had, I kept one copy of everything that I was in, which now I regret because every time I move, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. really heavy to move. <laughs> But I should probably get them scanned. One day I'll have to pull them all yeah. out, get them scanned. I don't know. I, I don't have any covers up anywhere. That's, they're that's just all funny. they're all in storage. It, it's kind of weird how um, you know. I I always I don't even know you know talking about phrases or sayings that I heard. But I, there's a saying. I, I never look back because I'm not going in that direction. Yesterday really doesn't mean anything. You know, right. at, in the, at the end of your life, you don't want to be lying on your deathbed and think. You know, I, 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 I look back too much, you know, you, right. you were all supposed to be going forward. And also, so I think that's awesome. That if, you're if you look back too much and you're always <clears throat> hanging on the fact that you had those magazine yeah. covers, well, I'm not going to, I'm not on those magazine covers now. Yeah, oh, gotcha. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is 10 years since I've been on my last magazine cover. So if I hang on to that and that's all I've got, then that's, that defines yeah. me, then I'm in trouble because who, who am I today? Right. Right? If I'm saying, oh, remember me? Yeah. I was on those covers, remember? Right. First of all, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Second of all, that's in the past. It's yeah. something I did. I'm proud of it. Um, I was able to inspire people. But today, I am hair, a hair and makeup artist. Mm -hmm. I am a, an official artist for the Olympia and many other shows. Mm -hmm. um, I hire a team of artists to come and help me because now you know, I get overbooked and I've got to have a team no there to do, like the Olympia is going to be a big show. Yeah. If I'm the official artist, I'm taking all the bookings and mm. then I hire the artist oh, to nice. take care. Got it. So, but I myself just like to sit there. I like to be able to talk. To, I do 30 minute sessions of full stage glam and I get to talk to women. Yeah. Of and that includes ages. the spray and everything. You're doing all of that? I don't do the body okay. spray. They come to me after they're sprayed up to I here. See. So their their bodies are dark, their yeah. face is white, and I got to go in and, and match them magic. up and yeah. uh, glam them up. That's incredible. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that. I think that's cool that you get to determine the people that you're going to work with as opposed to the other way around, but also you get to select um, people that you know will, yeah. will represent your brand. Yeah, exactly, because right yeah, I vet right. them all. I mean, you gotta really look in their, in their social media and see what all they've got going on, make yeah. sure that they can do a good yeah. job. No, I can imagine. Yeah. How, um, you know, you mentioned the eating disorder, and, and I, I wanted to, you know, I, I don't like dwelling on the negative, you know, the salacious type stuff, because one, I think there's enough outlets out there where you can find that type of stuff, but yeah. also it's, it's really not my flavor. I don't really like dwelling on that stuff at all in life, but 
you know, when, when you're dealing with an issue like that in your life and it, 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 it's, it dramatically impacts a lot of what you do, I wanted to have a conversation with you because I know that there's going to be hopefully a lot of young ladies who will eventually somehow see this and, and can relate to, you know, here's somebody who dealt with the same thing that I may be dealing with and I was able to get past that or see that you were able to get past mm -hmm. that, that, that will give them the courage or the strength to say, I can do this too. Can, can we dive into that just yeah, briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, like I said, I had, I had it from a very young age. It turned into bulimia, mm. which is something that is about control. That's all it is, it's about control. Because mm. nobody can control what you're going to put into your body and then how you're going to discard it because you're traumatized about something and you're getting back at somebody else, but you're really just getting back at yeah. yourself because it's, it's <laughs> self-destructive. Sure. And, but it's something that you feel you have control over. Mm. That's what it's about. It's <clears> about <throat> control. So when I have girls come to me and, hey, Elaine, you know what? Um, So-and-so sent me to you. Uh, what do you think I should do, bikini or figure? I want to start competing. I look at them, talk to them for five minutes, and I go, so how long have you had an eating disorder? You can just pick it oh, up. Oh, I can tell. And I'm looking them right in the eye, and <laughs> tears well up. <laughs> they start sure. to cry. Yeah. Well, I used to be an alcoholic, and then I, you know, they basically. When you mention control, vice. that's the first word that came right. to my head. Right. And so we talk about it, and I say, you know what? I go, you've got some deeper seated issues here, and you need to seek some type of help to find out what that dark secret is, or why that trauma yeah. is still there, because your eating disorder is one type of control, but so is this industry. So I don't want to see you, I'm not going to be an advocate of you coming into this industry, now you're going to compete, you're going to have the, the food regimen, the oh, training yeah. regimen, everything is going to be it's super, pressure. super structured yeah. and pressured, but, it's, but you have more control, it's just control, control, control. This industry can be a coping mechanism for people who aren't, don't want to really look at themselves and find out where, what those deep issues are. They're going to dive into the, okay, I'm eating seven times a day and I'm training at this time and I'm training at this time and I'm doing my cardio here. It's just a way for them to gain control mm -hmm. over their lives. So when I have that talk with girls, I'll say, you're going to come to me when you got a healthier, when you're in a healthier place, mm -hmm. then you decide to compete. Cause I don't want you to use this and go down a destructive path where now you're closet eating a jar of peanut yeah. butter because you couldn't have it. For, right. you know, we don't want to. We don't want to make you sicker. Sure. So people don't think about that psychological aspect I didn't. of I, our I, industry. I, my first thought would have been, well, if they're able to cope with it and gain a greater level of control, a higher degree of control over it, doesn't that mean that they could be better for them? Yes, it can be healthy. I'm not saying for everybody it's unhealthy because I had to use that very thing to become healthier because I was in the middle of that when I was competing as a pro. I, I hadn't gotten, I'll, tell, I'll go into a second what I did to get my brain rewired sure. to become healthier mm -hmm. in my thought processes and get rid of the depression. But I decided, okay, either the food's gonna control me mm -hmm. or I'm gonna control the food. So I'm gonna control the food by saying, okay, you know what? I gotta eat fish four times today. I'm gonna make it taste so good. I'm gonna use it. Every time I eat that fish and that rice, or that sweet potato or whatever, I'm gonna be leaner and meaner. Like I decided to turn my thought process around about the eating and make it work for me to become a better athlete. So I had to become very positive. But Saturday rolls around, everybody's asking you on Monday, so are we going on Saturday? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you, even Jay Cutler wanted to be a part of one of my cheat days because they wanted to witness it because they had all heard about it. It, was, it had its own reputation. He huh? wanted to have a competition with me oh to God. see if he could eat more pasta than me. Oh my God. Jay Cutler, right. what is he, 300 pounds? Yeah. I'm like, okay. Four time Mr. Olympia. Give it your best right. shot. <laughs> you beat him? You did it? I, we never oh, did okay, have okay. the competition because I ended up <laughs> getting him a hard time healed it. before we had a chance to have that competition. Right. But I had another male bodybuilder friend. His name is Rock Shabazz. Mm -hmm. He lives in, um, he was in the 200, yep. 203 category, 204. What is it, the 203? Uh, whatever it's it, called, yep. um, professional bodybuilder. So we finished the Olympia together and then he and I went out to get our, um, our donuts. What, what are the, what's the, Krispy Kremes, Krispy okay? Kremes. We got 24 Krispy Kremes, two large Domino's Philly cheesesteak pizzas with oh all God. the Cinestics. We start eating in the car, he's driving, he's holding his pizza, I'm on my, I ate my whole large pizza while we're in the car, I ate my Cinestics, we pull up at the donut shop. He looks at me, he looks at my pizza. He's like, 
you win. I, I don't even know what's happening right now. <laughs> and, and still he couldn't champ. finish his. Right, right. And then we're going in for the donuts, and then I'm eating six donuts. Like it was, it was ridiculous because yeah. it was all up here. Sure. My body should have never physically been able to eat all that food, yeah. but I could. Um, so it was really dysfunctional. Yeah. So what I turned that around into, instead of obsessing about Saturday about that cheat day, people would ask me, so what are we having on Saturday? Where are we going? I'd say, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to have a cheat day this week. I'll see. I'll see how I feel. I had to say that to myself. Huh. I'll just see how I feel. I'll wing it. You know, I, I may, I may not. Because your words are very powerful and you are listening to every word you say. Yeah. More so than what other people say. Oh, You're yeah. listening to what you say. So say the right thing. So we get to the restaurant on Saturday. I'm like, I feel really differently about today. I'm not going to order everything on the menu. Nice. I'm going to try a little bit of this, try a little bit of this. I don't have to have that meal heal me, whatever is going on right. inside. Because it's a pain inside deep from childhood trauma, from any kind of trauma you may have experienced that causes the coping, the requirement for the coping mechanism. That's fascinating. I guess, you know, not to, not to belittle that fact or, or, or any of the pain that anybody experiencing has to deal with, but I, I guess it's the same as an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction or anything. It, you're Choose really your trying vice. to cover up some yeah, pain and, exactly. and finding something to mm -hmm. do that with. Some are more dangerous than sure. others. Like alcohol is a very dangerous yeah. one. You know, heroin, meth, all those things. Yeah. But I guarantee you that person just didn't decide, hey, I really want to try some <laughs> meth today. Uh, oh, yeah, right. No. <laughs> There's some inner There's pain, pain that draws them to something that's going to fix them that day. And if you can, <clears throat> if you can mask your pain and and hide your pain and mellow out your pain with a substance, for me it just happened to be food. Yeah. But it's really no different. No, I agree. It, it, it's it really gives me something to think about because you know I'm I'm not like a huge drinker or you know any of the, I don't have to deal with any of those issues. But when you think about, we all experience pain. We're all hurting in some way or have been hurt or whatever. And how do we Absolutely. overcome that in a in a more positive manner? And how many people do you know come home at the end of the day, oh my gosh, I've got to have a drink, the kind of day that I just had, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and we're relying on alcohol to do what? Yeah, ease the pain. Ease our pain yeah. from the day, ease our pain from whatever. I choose huh. now not to do any of that. I choose to face it, talk about it. Yeah. And you were never a big drinker anyway. No, so I was never a drinker. You know, do you think it's harder... Just from a cultural perspective in the United States, we're such a food-oriented culture. You know, like, what do you want to do? Well, let's just go grab a bite. Two people can't sit on a patio and look no. at, you know, the backyard. No. You have to, it has to be food or beverages exactly. involved. Exactly, definitely. So, I so mean, someone dealing with that issue, that kind of compounds the problem for them. It does. And if, if, our, if our society and culture would realize how dangerous that is and just start putting healthier perspectives on everything else and not um, the ads you see about food and restaurants and, and drinks and fun and, and resorts. And what are they doing? They're selling something. Yeah. So yeah. they're selling for us to be obese. They're selling for us to have problems. Come to Vegas. Oh, what happens in Vegas stays mm -hmm. in Vegas. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It's going to follow you around to yeah. the end of time. Some more than others. Right, exactly. So, yeah, you just have to take responsibility for yourself, for your thoughts, for your actions, and just face them. Because you're not just going to go through the good times. You actually have to go through the bad times to get to more good times. It's like walking through the valley of shadow of death, mm -hmm. you know. You're going to go through that, yeah. but you have to go through that to get to here. I don't regret, regret a marriage. I don't regret I don't regret a relationship right. because every one of them taught me so much. That's why my, my ex-husband, we were married 20 years. Mm -hmm. He was my coach. He was everything. Um, he and I are best friends. That's awesome. We call each other sister and brother now. He's remarried to a wonderful woman. They're like my brother and sister nice. now. Like we are so close. Wow. That's incredible. But so much was learned. We just decided to salvage the friendship part of that relationship mm -hmm. and, and keep it. You know, yeah. it's all a choice. I agree. You know, uh, how... How does, you know, you said you have to identify those and then confront them and have the courage to go through. You know, how, how does one go about, I mean, it takes a certain amount of fortitude 
And I'll, I'll just speak, this is my own personal opinion. I'm not trying to say that you feel the same way or speak for anybody here. But I, I look around and I feel like as people, we're kind of going in the wrong direction when it comes to fortitude and making the right decisions and being better. You know, I, I, I'm very fortunate that, you know, I, I get to pay my bills by having conversations with high performance individuals. And that in and of itself rubs off on me because I get to be around all these wonderful people and have these text conversations. What would you do in this experience or whatever? But how does somebody who doesn't maybe have access to you or in your brain and be able to pick that on any given day, how, how does how do they locate that and then take it and allocate it towards fixing their problem when yeah. everything triggers them? Exactly. You know, going to a restaurant, you're going to be triggered. Yeah. That's huge because um, we, we can all only do so much. And that's why there's so many outreach programs, I think, because mm -hmm. if you know that you can talk, let's just say you're like really inspired to make a difference. Mm -hmm. you, go, you know what? I'm going to go talk to the young people. I'm going to find out in a school how, as a fitness professional, I can go talk to all these young people mm -hmm. and just give them a seed of a different perspective. Because yeah. maybe they go home every day and they're having Cheetos and <laughs> Pepsi and nobody cares about them. Right. Nobody's feeding them a, you know, three square meals a day. Sure. How, how, their life could be terrible. How are they going to find that? I think more of us need to do some kind of an outreach mm. because... Our, all of these lives matter and we're not making them matter if we don't do something about it. Yeah. So I feel like, again, I feel so blessed I can sit there in front of uh, a girl. I, sometimes I'm doing, I do 24 girls makeup back to back. No kidding. 24. I'll stand in the that. same position for 12 hours. <laughs> I didn't know that. 30 minutes. And I give the very last girl the same of me that the very first five girls got. And I'm exhausted at the end of the day, oh, but I man. feel like I gave something. But like you say, you we're talking about communities that don't have the opportunity to see the potential for change. That that has to be hard. Yeah. I think there has to be more outreach. Yeah. Every time I see outreach, like in communities, like in very poor communities or any kind of community where you know there's a great need there, I just really applaud the people yeah. that go back and just go into the streets and just talk <clears throat> to people, talk mm -hmm. to kids. Yeah. We have to make a difference. I agree. I agree. It's, I mean, it's that important. There are programs out there too that, for instance, I'll tell you how I got my, I call it getting my brain fixed. Um, I was told about a program from a war vet who experienced this, um, you've heard of neurofeedback, biofeedback, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? It basically forms new neural pathways in your brain. Mm -hmm. So they use it on a lot of PTSD. So whether you came back from the war, whether you were beaten half to death all your life, whatever your trauma is, you've got PTSD mm -hmm. to a degree, this is the place for you. Some people have some kind of trauma, maybe don't have uh, PTSD so as, as far as that goes, but some do, some don't, sure. but there's, everybody kind of needs their brain tweaked. Agreed. I'm sure you can <laughs> yeah, agree. Yeah, I'll, I'll sign up for that. Today. Right, and so <clears throat> they called me one day and they said, hey, and they knew I suffered from depression. So I could be at a real high when I'm at one of my shows. You know, you're talking to people, you're inspiring people, but then you go back to your closed doors and fly home. You're like, oh, here we go again. Yeah. And it's, you're feeling it at a four out of a 10 in your brain. Because yeah. sometimes our brains are wired wrong. It's a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. Could be um, chronic depression, whatever, whatever it is, it's real. Yeah. You know, someone can say, you got, you know, what are you worried about? You have the world, you know, the world by the tail. What, what could you possibly be depressed right. about? It's not a choice for some people. Sure. It's an actual chemical imbalance, which was in my case. So when I went in for this treatment, he goes, I'm going to pay for it. You're going. I want to see you get fixed. Are they in Miami? I went to the one in Miami, okay. and this one's called Pathwaves Life. Okay. Have you heard of it? I, I reached out to them. I spent my winters in Miami and uh, oh I reached out to them, but they didn't have an appointment opening for me. Listen, while I'll I was there. personally take you there because they are very good friends of mine okay. now. The owner has the same birthday as me, so nice. we became good friends. Right. He saved my life. So I went in there suffering from depression, anxiety, fear my whole life. I go in there and I go, okay, so so and so sent me, you know, nice to meet you. I probably looked 10 years older than I was at the time because I was just, I had the life sucked out of me. I was mm. just depressed. Yeah. And um, he goes, listen, so they did the ma brain map of my brain. So they, they hook your electrodes up to your, every aspect of your brain mm. so they can read the brain waves and see what it is your brain is actually doing. Uh -huh. And sure enough, they told me what my problem was. They said, we can fix you. 
I said, I'm not leaving here till you fix me. <laughs> and so it's uh, every two hour session is equivalent to about a year of psychotherapy. Whoa. In two hours. Oh it God. changes the brain that fast. So I said, okay, and they always recommend for, they said you have PTSD equivalent to anybody who has gone to the war or whatever in your environment, you're suffering from the same level of PTSD. I'm like, what, really? So um, they said, you know, we're gonna fix you. So I did, I said, I have eight days to do 20 sessions. Oh my God. So I did three two hour sessions a day for eight days. And they said, are you sure you have? I'm like, yep. <laughs> Line it up because yeah. I'm not leaving here with depression. Right. So she, they said, well, they called me, called me the kamikaze because I wanted to be fixed so badly that I did it all at once. Just dove in and didn't right. come out till it was done. Was that grueling? It was grueling as far as they were concerned. But for me, when you wake up with a brain every day that tells you, why do I have to be here today? Mm. Why would my brain ask me that? Yeah. Why do I have to be alive? Why? Yeah. I don't want to be here. And there's no reason for that other right. than that my brain is wired sure. wrong. So they told me, yeah, that your brain is wired this way from this, this years of your childhood and you leave as an adult, but your brain still is that wired that way. Yeah. So it took the 20 sessions was equivalent to about 20 years of psychotherapy in eight days. I'm telling you, you're going to go back because this is a, this is a, a it's a, a, a incredible. It's like if, if, new neural pathways are formed and the old neural pathways are put to bed, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, no matter what comes up in your life, you're not immediately going back to old habits and thinking about things or reacting to things in that way. You stop and you're like, oh, wow. If that would have happened five years ago, I would have done this. Oh. Now I'm sitting here going, yeah, you know what? That's not happening right now. Yeah, it happened to me before. It's not happening right now. Your, your, your brain, your left and right brain integrate to accept, so you've got your creative brain, you've got your analytical yep. brain, everything just integrates so you have full understanding, even if you were traumatized and now you're triggered about something, you have full understanding so you can say, yeah, you know what, it's not happening right now, I'm gonna move on. And your brain is just different. Love it. And I suffered from no more depression, I suffered from no more anxiety and no more fear, I have fear of nothing. I wouldn't be sitting here having an interview, that's how afraid I was of everything. Walking on stage was terrifying for me, like crippling right, fear. Right. And so I'm, I have a different head on my shoulders and I thank Pathwave's life for that. Incredible. No, it I, is incredible. I, I'm, I'm definitely going now. I'm definitely going. They called me recently because there's, they call me all the time because uh -huh. of my testimony, but there's a, a doctor that they want to have come working with them uh, because they have doctors, they have scientists, they have a little, little bit of everything yeah. so that they can help somebody in every way imaginable. Mm -hmm. So they had me talk to him on the phone and once I was done, he's like, okay, that is the most amazing <laughs> change I've ever. And another thing, my eating disorder was instantly gone. The coping mechanism no longer required. I, to this day, have to remind myself to eat. Incredible. <laughs> when I could think of nothing but food 24-7 yeah. before that. Yeah. So now I'm just like, oh, shoot, I'm getting hungry. I guess I better eat again. Yeah. Oh. Okay, what am I going to have? I'll just have a shake just so I can get on with my day. Yeah. Like, I don't care about food anymore. And so that was the most remarkable miracle for me. I think that's incredible, and I can't wait to get back down there and, and spend some time with them because I'm going to hook you up with the right I, people. There's uh, Jeff and Ryan; yeah. they're running the show over mm -hmm. there. They're both amazing guys, and they all. I I, I can't wait. I'm super excited. Yeah. I, I I really love everything about what we talked about today because you know we most of the time I try to get into people's heads about reinvention and mm -hmm. you know but you had you you had your own business before you were in the fitness competition world you were already doing that so it was it was almost like that was the side hustle for you <laughs> not the other way around right and, it and was so I guess your reinvention was actually stepping on stage and being able to tackle this. The fear. The fear. You know, and I've heard you say um, before uh, in quotes, I think I heard you in a conversation when you were training someone, though, like if you wouldn't go back and change anything because you don't have room for fear in your life or something anymore. And There's just having this no conversation, time for yeah. it. Yeah. Like you said, you can't go back. You can only move forward. Every time we go back or want to beat ourselves up for something, it does nothing. Yeah. You're just wasting pressure. You'll never get those moments back. So 
move forward. And I'll tell you, I, I struggled with that in the, in the beginning because when I got healed, I was almost 45 years old. I'm like, so wait a minute. <laughs> I'm 45 and I'm going to start living. Yeah. Part of me was so angry. Oh, I would be too. I was. I felt like I lost 40 plus years of my life and I could never get that back. And I was like, okay, 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 Elaine, you can't focus on that. You can't <laughs> focus on that. Just move forward. Yeah. And then I had to realize, okay, take your 45 year old butt and just get on with it yeah. because now you're living. You don't have depression, anxiety, fear. Now you can have healthy relationships. That's why my marriage has failed. Mm. When you suffer from depression, that that yeah. makes a lot of havoc on a marriage, you know. And now I'm single. I don't even care to be in a relationship because I'm perfectly happy right. on my own. Yeah. And I've never been this way in my life. Never been this way in my life. Man, I I, I am like I'm teasing ear to ear. I, it's on control. <laughs> I'm so happy for you because I think that is thank you. That, that's where everybody wants to be. You know, I I, I run around and I think like I you know I get to live my dreams. I'm, I, I I feel like I'm one of, you know, I always say to my friends, I'm God's favorite, you know, I have to be. You are Cause blessed. Because like my life is like that right. awesome. But it, it, it's really awesome to meet and, and have a conversation with somebody who's also in a really happy space. And especially at this point, I don't know if it's for humans or our country or whatever, but there's a lot of just, it's like the TV you leave, used to leave on in the middle of the night, the white noise that comes through and it's, just, it's a lot of static and friction everywhere. And to, and to hear you say that is uh, it's it is there's a lot of for sure. and again we have to follow this positive route because the world is in a really nasty place right now as far as I'm concerned yeah. and we have to try to make a difference if we can or even just get through it ourselves I can imagine if I was still suffering from depression and had to face some of the realities today yeah. that we're dealing with I don't know how I would even oh, deal yeah. with that so yeah it's really important and and again when I look at what I accomplished, I had a clothing company early on. I owned, we owned a gym uh, for nine years in British wow. Columbia. Uh, we had a clothing company. We had a supplement company. Then I started competing and then in my makeup and hair business. I did all that in spite of myself. Mm -hmm. What can I accomplish now that I'm no longer oh. suffering from those things? If I just got through that day to day yeah. and it was just, just a way, something to help you forge forward, yeah. right? But now I don't suffer from that anymore. I've got my own hair and makeup business. I'm, it's growing. Um, I consider myself, I, the, the best part of my day is when I get to talk to somebody and help somebody. That's awesome. That feels really good yeah. to me. Helping is something God has always had me yeah. do. I love helping people. So I, I, I think it's endless what you can accomplish and you can continue That's to reinvent incredible. yourself. You know? incredible. You know Dave Batista, the actor? Yeah. When, uh, I had a conversation with him. He was telling me back when he was in the WWE. He was yeah. like, he said the exact same thing. He said, the 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 best times I can remember is when I got to say something to somebody who come up and just thought it was, it, that I was this guy, you know, their favorite wrestler or whatever. And I mean, you see him on like the Avengers movies or whatever, and he looks right. like a big guy. But if you meet that guy in I person, have. he's he, a true giant. Tr I mean, he's just a Hulk of a man. Yeah, he is. He's like impressive. <laughs> and so for him to be like. You know, he's a very quiet and reserved guy in real life, but you, you, you see that guy talking and, and, yeah. and think about him giving somebody a, a pat on the back saying you're going to be all right. That's really it's nice huge. to hear because you don't hear a lot of that in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't and think he's a big Hollywood guy. I mean, that, that he's in Florida and he's better. doing his thing. I, <laughs> yeah. I think he works in Hollywood, but he doesn't mm -hmm. live in Hollywood, so that's yeah. a good thing. A um, couple more things, because I know you sure. got a, you, you have a mountain of things to do. You're like the busiest lady. Oh, in the I'm world. all yours. I open my I open my schedule up for you. Well, thank so you, thank you. you. I'm so important. You are. Um, I. Uh, what do you think about the state of um, the 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 pro fitness industry right now? I mean, aside from the issues that you you you, you mentioned, a lot of the, a lot of the girls that you meet are right. dealing with. What do you think about the situation? I think it, it has evolved a lot. Um, I don't know who's ultimately responsible or how we can, you know, calm it down a little bit, but I feel like it's evolving in the sense where, okay, if I show you pictures of myself on the Olympia stage as a figure athlete, it would look more like a bikini girl on stage today. Yeah. So it's evolving. The girls are getting, you know, harder and, and they're just, it's evolving. Sure. And I, I don't I have see to that. tell you I how. I see that, yeah. Like figure is becoming physique, physique is becoming bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. It just keeps evolving. Yeah. And so I just know that I was in it at the right time yeah. because I uh, worked really, really hard for 17 years 
before I even got on stage, powerlifting, like, <laughs> he, okay, my ex and I were powerlifting together, yeah. so on squat day, you can imagine what that looked like. Oh, yeah. I would headbutt him, I'd have a goose egg on my <laughs> forehead, I would head slap him, he'd pick one up off the floor and hit him, open hand slap across right. the side of the head as hard as you can, because he's got to get under a yeah. 700 pound squat. Oh my God. And so it was like, ah, you know, yeah. that animal, right. that animal stuff. And that's where I came from. Mm -hmm. So I worked really, really hard to get there. And I didn't even know that people were using stuff other than male bodybuilders, right. of course. I didn't know people were using stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was- Supplements. Yeah, supplement, <laughs> extra supplements. And I was like, oh gosh, I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't. And it was told to me by, many a magazine editor yeah. that we can't use this girl anymore we can't use this girl anymore because their faces have changed and we you know and i'm like oh so that's why i'm still modeling for you at the age of 48 yeah. because i didn't do certain things yeah. because it was changing the faces and the bodies and everything and some people were just taking it to an extreme some don't was that was that because of the pre external pressure or did they you think that was a self-imposed level of pressure where if i do this i'll Hit another, uh, hit another peak or I another I think it's plateau. both. I think it's if the external pressure tells you, oh yeah, if you want to get here, you're going to have to, okay, I'll do that to push yeah. myself. So you have to agree to it. Sure. I mean, I never agreed to it. Right. Uh, I felt like, no, I put on a lot of muscle power lifting, so I had to tone it down to get into figure competing because I had, I mean, I had, I forget what my biceps were at one point. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and so I had to kind of tone things down to get into figure. I didn't have to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to judge anybody because sure. I don't know what it's like to start from this and go, oh, in two years, I got to, so I got to put on this much muscle. Yeah. I, I was putting on muscle yeah, yeah. for years, like almost two decades before I competed. Yeah. So I can't, I could never judge what anybody else does and, and their reasons for doing it. But I'm just glad I was at the, that time and that place because I could not compete in figure now. Damn. I would not be, I would sure. not be at that level. Right. Incredible. No. What advice would you give to a young girl who's, uh, who didn't have a, an eating disorder and still wants to get into this? Well, what I would tell anybody, and what I do tell girls, is I tell them to stay true to yourself and don't let anybody else dictate to you or tell you this is what you're going to have to do. Oh, if you want to get here, I can take you there. But this, you know, no, decide before you go in there. And I tell them that with photo shoots too, because you'll walk into a photo ah. shoot and all this photographer tells you what little he wants you to wear for your photo shoot yeah. and how he wants you to turn around. I'm like, mm, no. Yeah. I was at a flex photo shoot. Like, sure, the photographers, they get to keep the pictures for their websites and everything yeah. else. So, yeah, could you just turn around a little more? I go, no, we're not doing that today. That's not part of oh, this agenda. Something a little more risque, shoot. you mean? Right. Oh, I see. And I was already, well, I mean, we, pers we wore some pretty risque sure. things, yeah, yeah. but how a woman poses her body <laughs> has a lot to do with how she's perceived, either as a victim or as a strong yeah, woman right. that chooses to pose a certain way. Yeah. You're a victim in certain types of poses. Mm -hmm. And so I just knew that when I went in there, I knew how much I was going to wear, how little I was going to wear, and how I was going to pose so that nobody else would dictate to me, oh, if you want to get anywhere, you're going to have to do mm. this for me. No, I'm not going to have to. And actually, I'll leave yeah. if that's what you think that I'm here for. Because right. you have to know who you are and what you're willing to do. In a photo shoot, on stage, anything. Because I, again, I was training this young girl and she was a first time bikini competitor. Mm -hmm. And she tells me that her, yeah, so my coach told me to take the little, the little blue pill on this day. And that I go, he did what now? I go, what are you competing in? Bikini. How many times have you competed? I never have. And you're, I go, you better not take one little pill in yeah. your body yeah, yeah. or I'm a smack you, yeah, right? Yeah. So you, you have to have your own boundaries, know where you're gonna go. Yeah. I got a lot of girls that sit in my chair and say, yeah, you know, if I'm gonna continue in this, I'm gonna have to get a little bigger, but I'm kinda, you know, struggling because I like the way I train. I go, listen, if you like the way you train and you don't wanna train this way, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Because when all this competition stuff is over and you're not making any money, honey, when this is over and you're just walking in a grocery store or in a restaurant and you want to still look like a woman or you want to feel like a woman and not have guys walk up to you and say, hey, can you flex for me? Right, right. Can you spot <laughs> me, bro? Just know what you, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got to know what you want to do. And I right. said, be in this sport because you love it mm -hmm. and do it the way you love it. 
Don't let somebody else tell you you're going to have to get bigger. You're going to have to do this because then they're changing you. You're going along with it, but you're the one who suffers in the end sure. because he's long gone because he got his accolades for getting you where right, you needed to be, right. and now he's gone. But in, in, in such a material, I don't want to drag this out. But you're so oh, this conversation is so for another fascinating. Hour. I'm fine. The the, uh, the we live in such a materialistic society that when you tell uh, certainly a young girl, and I do know that it's harder for women because let's just take all of what we're talking about and set it here for a second, put a pin in it. If you look at how culturally girls have been taught for. I don't know, longer than I've been alive, you know, do what you got to do, get a good man, he's got money, he can take care of you and all that. And it teaches, there was a time when that was relevant because the man went to work or did what he had to do and the woman, culturally, I'm not assigning anything to yeah, anybody, no, don't I, I, light I me up. I completely understand. You know, the women stayed home and took care of kids mm -hmm. and raised it and there was a, there was a joint effort mm -hmm. there. But now we don't, you know, we're living in a much different society. So a girl may, a young woman may have to realize that she has to excel financially or find a way to get ahead a little more to stay out from behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, do you, how does that individual, that, and I agree with you 100% because you don't want to sell yourself out. You always feel worse for it. But how, how do you get them to see that perspective when it's so tough for them, you know, when they're saying, if I just do this, I will get an extra, or I will come up, or I will get a movie shot, or, you know. Right, right. It, it's just it's difficult. Relevant, Maybe right? you don't have the answer. Depending I'm just, it's on just what, hard. what is put in front of them. Um, see, I came from that era. I was born in 1964. Mm -hmm. I'm 58 years old. So I was born in that era where the man works, the women stay home and have sure, the kids. Yeah. And yeah, women can work too, but. It's, it's, it is that joint effort, but the woman isn't expected to go out and be ultra independent. <coughs> For some reason, and I think it was because I drifted away from my parents to a degree as much as I could, and I became very independent at a very young age, mm -hmm. I never wanted to have to rely on somebody, because that's kind of a scary place to be, is sure. when you have to rely on somebody to take care of you. And I've had friends who are like, I need to find a rich boyfriend. I go, no, you need to take care of yourself. So you never have to rely on a rich boyfriend. You have to come up with something. And so whether it's, you know, whatever your craft is, you still, if someone's asking you to do something that's uncomfortable, you can't sell your soul for your craft. Agreed. And as we know in this world, a lot of people have literally sold their souls <laughs> right. for their craft, yeah. okay? Where does that lead you? Straight to hell, yeah, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So I would never sell my soul for my craft. I'll walk out of the swimsuit issue, the lingerie issue, even though it's the most prestigious one going in the right magazine. No, if you're going to ask me to do something that I'm unwilling to do and you're going to put uh, an ultimatum on it, I'm walking. Yeah. If you want me here to be a model, I'll be the best model I can be. Yeah. And ironically, when you come in with that attitude, they don't mess with you. I love it. And I was in every centerfold for every lingerie and flex swimsuit issue when I was modeling for that magazine, I was a centerfold every year and I never sold out to do yeah, that. That's so awesome. that makes me feel good. But for anybody, acting, music, anything, don't sell your soul for that. Yeah. Because everything has a price and because I'm not a materialist, I would never make materialism so important mm -hmm. that I had to get there. Right any way, shape, or form. No, I got my morals and my principles, and that's part of being raised in a, in a Baptist minister's yeah, yeah. family, is you have that edge, is yeah. that you, you do have that, that moral fiber sure. where you're like, no, I've got, I've got some things that I have to do and it's gotta be the right way. Mm. But as a woman, um, we're living in a world where women wanna be equal and women essentially are equal in many ways. There's some things women can't do that men can do and vice versa, but you just, I'm not saying become an extreme woman's liver because sure. I'm not one of those either. Mm -hmm. I respect the man's role and I respect my own role. Sometimes I have to tone down mine because I feel like I can't accomplish anything. Yeah. But I, I wasn't always like that. I was a very fearful young lady. Mm -hmm. So now I'm saying anything that I set my mind on, I can do. If I find a partner in life that wants to share that life, great. Yeah. But I'm not going to rely on somebody to fill all the voids in my life. No. Sure. I say you become strong, get good at a craft, you know, 
get yourself as far as you can and don't sell out to get there. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's advice, but it's... I think it's quality, yeah. I, I think your story is amazing, Elaine. I know, I mean, you've you done movies, which we didn't even talk about. You did a movie, you've done, you got, you had, you've been an entrepreneur your entire life. You now have a clothing line. You have your own platform and business. What, what is next? What, what, yeah, that's is there gross. anything left? Or are you done? Like, what's you, up? You know what? And it's, for me, it's not what ladder can I reach next or mm -hmm. what rung on the ladder I can reach. For me, it's what's going on in the world right now. Okay, I'm seeing and hearing so much about child trafficking. Okay? Yeah. And it's rampant. I didn't realize how many children were stolen every year. For me, if I get into something that is <clears throat> above or beyond what I'm doing now as far as business goes, it's going to be something that's going to help communities, help people. I would rather dive in and go on raids rescuing children <laughs> from I the bad guys. With all the and tactical gear on. Oh, I yeah, believe I you. I believe the tactical you. Gear. <laughs> and actually, um, I'm probably going to get, I am, ironically, as you mentioned, there is something else. I'm going to get involved in a security company in Florida. I live, half, I live in Florida mm -hmm. and I live here. Okay. So in Florida, I'm going to get involved with a security company that is run by my ex-husband, mm -hmm. who was ex-SWAT. So he's a SWAT guy. Gotcha. So he was also a photographer in the fitness industry mm -hmm. as well, but he's done all kinds of things too. But we're, I'm going to join that business because there's so much need for good security. But in my heart, I would like to be rescuing children. Yeah. It might be something I will never do. I don't know. But... I just think that there's such a need for more important things in life than to me go out and make some more money or do this or that. I, I, need, to be, I need to be doing some good. Sure. Because this world is really an ugly place sometimes yeah. and yeah. we have to make it better somehow. So like that would be my thing is I'd be joining some crusade no, I love <laughs> to it. do something. I, I think, you know, if you got the time and you're able to do it, I think you'd be the perfect person for and it. And you have the, the right Glock. Yeah. <laughs> and the right guns. Yeah. Extra mags. <laughs> Extra extended mags. mags. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've right. got extended I mags. I love it. <laughs> uh -huh. um, tell people where they can find you, but also any of the other stuff where they can find you on the web uh, with yeah, the stuff you're um, involved in. I've, I've, got a, I've been working on a website for quite some time, but I'm so... I, I actually find it an annoyance <laughs> to have to get the website done. That will be done eventually, uh, but... Instagram, it's just at Elaine Goodlad, E L A I N E G O O D L A D. And then um, Elaine Makeup at hotmail.com is my email. And that's, that's basically it. The Blessed Bodywear is my clothing company. On, on uh, Instagram, it's at Blessed Bodywear. Okay. And we'll it's sure an amazing line. It's the softest material you'll ever wear. It's like a second skin, it's, it's literally amazing. And we are all online business, so nice. check us out. Cool. Yeah, that's it. Anything for men? Anything for men? On, we, on the, we're, on the, we're in actually the clothing? starting. Nice. Okay. Uh, so we start with some t-shirts and yeah. stuff, and we've got some really cool sayings. We've got a lot of patriotic shirts coming out. Cool. So I've got, you know, with the little flag on the sleeves yeah. or the, the black on black flag, like, it's like just it. like some cool right. stuff. So yeah, Check we're going to do more for men as I well. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Elaine. Give me some. I should have Thank you. you a shirt. Oh, it's I'm okay. We'll get it. We'll get it together. We'll get it together. Maybe. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it. I actually, I'm working on something in the clothing world too, so I'll, maybe I'll uh, pick your brain on that. Yeah, but, for sure. But look, thank again. You were the first female guest we had, and like, I'm this is, so honored. I think this is our third set. Well, I don't know if you call it a season or whatever. We're just always taping. But um, but thank you so oh, much for thank being you for here having and me. making really this so awesome. It. And I've had an amazing time. So, guys, thanks for watching. Until we see each other again, be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and check out Elaine on all the platforms. We'll see you guys soon on Action Figures.